today we are welcoming uh, Tom Griffin and, and Walter Jameson, two very close colleagues of mine from uh, Toronto Metropolitan University, um, to talk about their Main Street Reimagined project. Um, they have developed a handbook and a guide for practitioners, which is very exciting. And so we welcome, we asked them at the Institute for Hospitality and Tourism Research to join us for our Compass Speaker Series um, to talk about some of the work that they did. I would like to start off with our land acknowledgement. Um, this is specific to Toronto Metropolitan uh, University. I'm currently residing um, in Oakville, um, which is uh, on the lands of the Mississaugas of New Credit. Um, but Toronto is in the Dish with One Spoon territory. The Dish with One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and the Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans, and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. Dish, or sometimes it is called the bowl, represents what is now Southern Ontario. We all eat out of the dish, all of us that share this territory with only one spoon. That means we have to share the responsibility of ensuring the dish is never empty, which includes taking care of the land and the creatures we share it with. Importantly, there are no knives at the table representing that we must keep the peace. So my name is Sonia Gracci. I am the director of the Institute for Hospitality and Tourism Research here at Toronto Metropolitan University, housed at the Ted Rogers School of Management. So the Institute for Hospitality and Tourism Research is uh, basically that, that we uh, work on uh, high quality hospitality and tourism research um, that has both scholarly value, but also practical significance to the tourism and hospitality industry. Um, we mobilize knowledge to enhance the research reputation and impact of Toronto Metropolitan University, um, particularly in tourism and hospitality. Um, if you have not been on our website, um, we, I urge you to go and I will put that in the chat. It's htmresearch.ca. Um, and some of the things that we do are produce uh, white papers that would benefit industry, um, research articles, if there's any that you see on the list that you want uh, to be given access to, then we can ask the authors, which are from our school, to do so. Um, we uh, work on various projects with industry related to sustainability, Indigenous issues, Main Street, um, destination marketing and management. Um, and, uh, and one of the initiatives that we started just a couple of years ago was our Compass Speaker Series. So that is what you are joining today. Um, Compass has been um, going on for about almost four years now. And basically it is a speaker series in which uh, we host researchers, um, both academic and industry from uh, all over the world. And we talk about various topics. So um, we've had, um, various researchers, you know, from Fogo Island um, or um, from other parts of the world, Japan, Australia, and all of these uh, speaker series record, speaker series recordings are found also on our website under the Compass Speaker Series tab. So if you want to take a look and see if there's anything else that interests you, please do so. So today we have um, two of my favorite colleagues. Uh, speaking today about um, their Main Street initiative. So Tom, um, Dr. Tom Griffin, is an associate professor in our school at the School of Hospitality and Tourism Management. He is also the assistant director of the Hospitality and Tourism Research Institute. Um, Tom has a PhD in Recreation and Leisure Studies from the University of Waterloo. His research interests revolve around visiting friends and relatives, um, and specifically immigrants who host visitors and the implications for community development and indiv individual well-being and the tourism industry. Tom is also interested in virtual reality and the impacts on the tourism industry, and his research has been published in various tourism journals and presented at international conferences. Um, he lectures on a variety of topics. He is our uh, tourism professor extraordinaire. He teaches our large tourism courses. He teaches courses in research and in tourism policy. 
Um, and uh, he is one of our most beloved professors um, because of his lovely good nature and his caring, very caring mentality. So thank you, Tom, for joining us today. And Walter, what can I say about Walter? Walter um, is our adjunct professor. Um, Walter has more than 40 years of experience um, in bridging the academic and consultancy worlds through creativity, innovation, and out-of-the-box thinking. His activities have been based on a sound set of responsible and sustainable values and principles. His activities include early work in Canada using tourism and heritage resources as tools for community and economic development, research and consultancy work in China, extensive community-based tourism work in Asia, exploring the power of tourism as a tool for economic and social development. Um, he has been involved in a wide range of capacity building exercises in many parts of the world and has held a number of executive positions um, in a variety of organizations. He was also um, the Dean of a hospitality and tourism program in Hawaii and in Thailand. Um, and every time you talk to Walter, you find that he's worked on some amazing project somewhere doing something really, really interesting. Um, and I'm sure he's off to do something very interesting very soon. So thank you so much um, as well, Walter, for joining us today. So I'm going to just stop sharing this. And Tom, you can start. Great. Is that looking okay? Great. Thanks so much, Sonia. That was a lovely intro. Appreciate it. Walter. Thank you. I'd like to start off by thanking Sonia Du for her support for this project and most importantly to thank Tom for his um, uh, work on this project and his support throughout and it's been very much appreciated. Um, what we're going to do is Tom and I are going to alternate in presenting the ideas that came from the work we've done on the handbook. Um, next slide, Tom. We really started all this work um, by saying, is there any way that we as tourism people could help Main Street's BIAs uh, recover from uh, uh, COVID to help in the revitalization process? And so we went into this very much as asking that question as to whether the visitor economy could become a vehicle for development and revitalization. Next slide. And what we discovered very early on in our work is that um, both through the research we did and the many discussions we've had, uh, and Tom will describe a little bit more what we did, is that we came to the conclusion very quickly that every Main Street, whether it realizes it or not, is really part of the visitor economy or could be. And we don't advocate that every Main Street uh, should be a visitor destination, but we do feel that there are some strong reasons for Main Streets to consider um, how they might use the visitor economy um, as part of their overall strategy. Tom? Um, yeah, and, and so like a key uh, distinction that we start, you know, so we're tourism people, and I think when we started talking about tourism and visitors to Main Streets, uh, you know, we kind of think, tourism of people coming on from far away for kind of leisure vacation type reasons um and so you know quite quickly decided to not use the word tourism but really look at the word visitor and and and, and visitor for us it's really anyone that comes from outside of the community that we're we're interested in and so for a for a larger destination like toronto we're looking at people that come from outside of toronto but when we go to kind of neighborhoods and smaller towns and main streets it's really anybody coming from outside of that Main Street area to that Main Street area for any reason. And, you know, a, another important thing that we want to make clear is that we are not presenting ourselves as Main Street experts. Uh, there are many uh, people, many on this call, um, uh, many organizations that are doing some really great, important work for Main Streets. Um, we are tourism people and we are just bringing tourism ideas uh, and applications uh, to Main Streets uh, to see if they can fit and they can uh, benefit the Main Street economy and Main Streets in some way. Um, yeah, and so 
we're talking about main streets. And so we decided to use the term main street as much as possible uh, to really describe the, the, the place and the community. Um, and then, you know, thinking about main street organizations and BIAs, business improvement areas as the organizations that kind of represent and work with those places. So, you know, many main streets are, you know, small, but others are really large. Many are in large urban centers, but many are also in smaller places. Um, many are going through a variety of uh, economic situations. Uh, some have really strong, active visitor economy industries, while others are uh, not really engaged with that. Um, and really, it's just to say that main streets are not the same. Like they're, they're incredibly diverse, uh, and not one main street is exactly the same as another. Um, and so, you know, in a minute, we're going to explain what we went through to get to this stage. Uh, but the, the ultimate outcome of this project is that we've uh, just uh, re-released the, the handbook um, that we've been kind of developing over the last year or so. We kind of tidied it up and, and, and added a bit more content. Um, and so on our website, once Walter starts talking, I'll drop the website into the chat, um, is the new version of the handbook. And our intention with this handbook is that it's meant to be user-friendly. So it's not written for an academic audience. It's, it's meant to be uh, consumed by people working with main streets. Um, it is a living document. So we are always constantly looking to update it, improve it, add sections to it. Um, it has been co-created. So we have provided content ourselves, but we've also reached out and collaborated with a number of uh, professionals connected to the Main Street community, uh, some of whom are on this call, and we really value your input and your time and effort. Um, so it's not just me and Walter, it's it's a group of us. Um, and we've really tried to include uh, sections within each chapter that really sort of say, this is some tactics of how you can apply these ideas and uh, uh, move forward with this content. Um, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna briefly talk about what we did, um, and then we're going to go through very quickly an overview of the different chapters that we've uh, worked on and that we've presented as part of this handbook. Uh, and we'd like to leave a substantial chunk of time at the end for some questions and discussion. So this is uh, an overview of what we what we did to get into to, to create this handbook. And, and you know, I, I started in 2019. I was kind of curious about BIAs. Um, as organizations representing the community. And I'm from the destination marketing and management organization world, the DMO world. And I saw some uh, comparisons and I was kind of interested to see uh, whether as a, a community organization, there were overlaps or opportunities to learn from the DMOs and apply it to BIAs and main streets. And then of course, COVID happened and things changed. Uh, and we started working with uh, Natasha Francis, who was also on this call. And uh, Natasha has finished her master's now. Uh, and Natasha uh, conducted her master's thesis on um, BI. She interviewed 44 BIs across Canada. We, we participated in that, but that was really an initiative led by Natasha. Um, and that really informed and connected us with uh, some uh, ideas and collaborators for this project. And then of the last uh, uh, six to nine months, maybe even longer, we've been releasing, um, conducting these webinars all of which are recorded and on our website. Uh, most are attached to a particular chapter um, and uh, starting to produce these chapters relating to the different topics that we're gonna talk about. So this is a, an overview of the 13 chapters. There are now 13 chapters in our handbook. Um, if you've been part of our project, some of these will be familiar to you, um, but we've kind of uh, refreshed some of them uh, and, and tidied them up and packaged them up together. So we're gonna go through these and just spend 30, uh, just a, a little time on each of these chapters. So the first chapter is really kind of introducing how we understand the visitor economy. Um, and, you know, when we're talking about the visitor economy, it's really that bigger catch all term instead of tourism. And so tourism is part of the visitor economy, but the visitor economy is bigger than that. It includes people that are, all people that are visiting a community on Main Street for any reason. And so we start to think about commuters, students, international students, perhaps people that visit for retail, there's a particular event. Um, and, and so that kind of bigger idea of who is visiting, how do we understand them, and, and what can we do as a BIA or a Main Street community to engage them? And this is kind of a classic tourism um, uh, 
framework of understanding tourists uh, and really kind of looking at it through that pre-visit stage um, and then the actual during the visit stage and then the post-visit stage and thinking about why do people visit our destinations and our communities, who are our competitive set and what are we being compared against um, and where are people getting their information from and then how do they move through our communities what are the main interactions they have with the main reasons that they go there? If it's a festival, how what's their interaction with the festival? But then also they have lots of secondary interactions, the car park, the coffee shop, the washrooms, the benches, everything. So how, do, how does that whole kind of uh, package come together? And then after they've gone, what do they do with that experience? Do they share it on social media with their friends and relatives? Uh, and do they actually end up returning how frequently and so on? And so using this kind of framework of the pre, during and post, allows us as practitioners to kind of think, well, where can we kind of intercept um, and, and play a part in improving this uh, experience? Is it more marketing at the beginning? Is it providing information during their visit? Or is it encouraging people to interact with us after they've gone and, and go home? Or, or all, all three of those. The second chapter, um, this is kind of my uh, pet project um, relating to visiting friends and relatives. Um, and this is really about the idea that residents of any community uh, are a major reason why people visit that community. Um, and not only do they bring visitors to that place, they then also direct them around that place. Uh, they take them to their favorite uh, shops and places and events uh, and experience and, and, and show them around. And so they become kind of ambassadors and guides for that community. And it also is a way of either inspiring, but also obliging residents to go out and, and interact with their community as well. When people come to visit you, you kind of have to, you, you want to show them a nice time and you want to show off the area that you live in. And so, you know, in this chapter, I kind of outlined some ideas and some justification for BIAs to think about engaging their residents, uh, not just as consumers of shops and retail and so on within their own communities, but as ambassadors that can bring visitors and bring that kind of activity to their communities. Malta. One of the um, things that we kept hearing is that many main streets didn't really feel they were in the visitor business. And so what we did is put together a chapter that attempted to introduce um, main street coordinators or, or other people within the main street community to looking at what really is there. What do you really have that would um, be of interest to the visitor? And so one of the things we talk about is putting yourself in the visitor's shoes and to look at your main street, not from the point of view of people who use it every day, but from the point of view of a visitor who may only visit your main street on an occasional basis. And what we've done is created a series of forms that would allow you to begin to better understand uh, what you have to offer to the visitor. Um, the next couple of chapters, uh, we worked with some uh, experts from uh, uh, relating to uh, research and strategy. So this chapter, uh, I, I helped uh, write with Judy Morgan, who is on this call. Welcome, Judy. Uh, great to have you again on, on, on the session. Um, and Judy presented with uh, uh, Tim Coker from uh, the Waterfront BIA on, on, on this topic. And then Judy and I kind of wrote this chapter about how BIAs can collect data um, and really kind of trying to shape uh, and, in, and go through the process of, first of all, understanding what types of questions can be answered through data collection, um, where we can collect data from, some different ideas and approaches, um, also thinking about the time length of data collection. Is it a one-off at an event or should it be something that gets repeated time after time or, or, or benchmarked? Um, and also then some different ways of actually collecting data from doing surveys on the street uh, to doing interviews uh, and, and also observation of, of a main street and, and doing tallies of things that happen and descriptions of things that happen. Um, and, and then finally, you know, moving towards kind of some more complex studies with bigger questions uh, uh, Judy uh, helped prepare some kind of key questions to think about asking possible providers of those research services that a BIA could ask um, to make sure that they're getting the right services that they need. 
The next chapter um, was prepared by uh, Tanisha uh, Natu, who is works for Environics Analytics. And Tanisha uh, both presented um, for one of our webinars and then helped write a chapter on really the, the uh, services that they offer that help BIAs answer some really important questions relating to visitor activity. And so Environics, I'm sure many people on the call are familiar with them, um, offer a variety of different research sources uh, and then interpretation and packages that could meet the needs of a, a BIA, you know, varying in, in complexity. Um, you know, and so things like, you know, how many people are visiting my festival, um, how many people are returning back to the main street um, after pandemics, uh, how do we track the impact of marketing? Um, some of these types of questions were answered in Tanisha's uh, chapter and her webinar uh, and the services that Environix can offer. Um, we then worked with uh, Mary Patterson and Mary, um, uh, actually Mary and I worked together a long time ago at Tourism Toronto, it's now Destination Toronto. Uh, Mary uh, was the director of marketing at, at Tourism Toronto at the time. Uh, and so she, she comes from a destination marketing background um, and she now actually runs, uh, organizes, leads uh, the program called Shop Local to Win, which is a, a, a retail focused uh, uh, competition contest program that BIAs can, it's like a template that BIAs can uh, adapt and it encourages people to go shopping in, in local shops and they can cash in or, or submit their receipts for prizes and so on. Um, and so Mary uh, prepared this chapter on looking at the principles of destination marketing in relation to BIA. So this is somebody coming from a destination marketing uh, professional background who is now working with the BIA mainstream community. And she was able to kind of bring together some of the main principles of destination marketing that are relevant for uh, BIA communities. Um, and a couple of the key principles that she talked about were things such as, you know, starting off small and making small tweaks. And then once you've got that kind of package of marketing and promotions and engagement uh, kind of tight, being able to then uh, develop that uh, using the justification for that success and, and push that further and making it wider and more broad, uh, broader uh, to the wider community. So uh, a really useful uh, set of steps and guidelines for marketing for BIAs. Uh, Walter, did you want to do this one or shall I do this one? I can do it if you want, Tom. Great. Um, one of the uh, lessons that we learned through the interviews we did and from our research was that um, to be successful, certainly in the visitor economy, you have to work with a, a range of different stakeholders. Um, obvious ones might be your local uh, tourism authority, um, it could be your economic development officer, but that partnerships then are essential. And one of the themes that we kept hearing is that Main Street coordinators, Main Street committees are incredibly busy. Um, they have a wide range of activities. And so very often the visitor economy might be seen as just something else to add to the portfolio of responsibilities. And this is where partnerships come in, that working with people either within the BIA or the larger community or even in communities um, some distance away is that there are some very strong uh, uh, benefits to using the expertise, the resources, uh, the reach of partners in um, making best use of the visitor economy. And so we feel very strongly about the fact that this is something that will only succeed if you're working with others within the community or even the larger community. I just add here that this is uh, written by Natasha Francis, the master student who's now working with uh, Steps Public Art uh, and the impact of public art for Main Streets. Um, and, and the webinar included uh, uh, talks from uh, the Exchange District in Winnipeg and uh, Stratford City Centre BIA as well. Next slide, Tom. One of the things that is clear in the visitor economy and within the within tourism is that we're really in the business of providing and ensuring that um, the visitor has a great experience, that they leave with important memories, 
that they want to um, be in a position to recommend that people visit the main street or another kind of destination. And at the same time, it's got to be a good experience for the local people. And so one of the things that we talk about throughout the uh, handbook is really the fact that we're really in the experience business. How can we provide that good quality of, of, experience, of experience to the visitor? Um, and one essential element of that is service. And what we would like to say is that this requires to some extent a mindset change that while there are certain ways of providing services of dealing with your customers might be sufficient for the local community, maybe it means that there's a rethinking if you want to of what the visitor is gonna be looking for. Next slide. And so one of the tools that we talk about in this particular chapter, we, um, Frederick Dimash, who's our director, is really the idea of the journey. And Tom introduced this idea of really beginning to understand what the visitor needs to understand it and from the point of view of, of determining whether they want to visit your main street and while they're there and when they go back. And so we talk about that whole visitor journey. And we find that that's a really useful tool approach to beginning to determine what do you think that visitor wants and constantly be surveying your visitors to make sure that you're meeting their expectations. Next slide. Again, um, uh, Martin LaSalle, who has been with us right from the beginning, he's on the call today. And thank you, Martin, for working along with us. It was very much appreciated. Was really beginning to think based on Martin's extensive experience of how do we actually build new experiences? How do we begin to think about the fact that if we want the Main Street to be competitive from a visitor economy point of view, what are the kinds of things that, that could be done partly from the point of view of the private sector. What can the private sector start to do to deliver um, unique experiences that people recognize they have to travel to your main street to appreciate? And part of the mapping exercise that I talked about earlier attempts to do this, and it really begins to say, are you ready for the visitor? Um, do you have the right kind of services, parking, uh, signage, are your opening hours convenient for visitors? And so Martin talks very knowledgeably about the fact that how do you actually begin to understand the obstacles and the ideas that are necessary to be open to uh, the visitor business? Uh, and that kind of perspective is really important, uh, especially from the point of view of how can your businesses on Main Street become part of providing quality experiences. Next slide. One of the challenges that we found with Main Streets, not only in the surveys that we did, but from talking to um, experts in the field, is why would somebody come to your community? What, what is there? Every community has stores, they have potential parks, they might have a library, they may have interesting events, but what is unique about your community? And um, one of the challenges that we have and one of the opportunities that we have is what's the story that you wanna tell? What do you wanna tell people about your community before they come, while they're there? And what makes you particularly um, uh, worthy of attracting the visitor? And so we talk about how do you develop a story and how do you develop a story that's going to be of interest to the visitor? But equally, it's an opportunity for the people in the Main Street community and the larger community to talk about who they think they are and why they're important and what kinds of values that they have. And people are looking for that kind of opportunity, an authentic story. Next slide, Tom. And so we talk about a range of different ways that you can tell your story from very small, inexpensive, tactical ways to more uh, involved, uh, complex ways of doing that. But essentially, that story should be the principle that guides, if you want to, the kinds of things that you're doing 
remembering again that the visitor doesn't know your main street and how do you help guide them through this, through a trail or a maps or um, a smartphone application. And so we're very practical in the way that we're uh, attempting to use storytelling as an important part of reimagining Main Street. Next slide. Um, uh, Jeff Bray, who uh, heads up the Downtown uh, Business Association in Victoria and has been involved for a, a number of years in doing creative and innovative work, um, uh, thankfully agreed to um, talk about the whole idea of curating the Main Street. And what this really says is, what do we have now? And based on the research that you've done, the mapping you've done, the story that you want to tell, um, your understanding of the characteristics of the visitors that you think might be coming to your main street, what is missing? Is Are there things that are missing that if they were uh, added to the mix of things that you're offering in your main street would make it a more competitive uh, uh, a destination compared to others. And, and in many cases, one of your competitors could be the shopping center on the edge of town or in another community. And that those shopping centers very consciously think about the right kinds of things that should be there. So one of the challenges then is both understanding what you have, what's missing, and then the most important part of that, of course, is how do we get uh, activities that will um, present, if you want, to a more thorough experience. So what incentives can be there? What kind of support can be provided? And Martin talks about this also. But it's really beginning to think about the fact that maybe with the visitor economy, there's things that are not in your main street right now that may have sufficient, uh, 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 sufficient audience to begin to um, not only provide added or important services to the visitor, but also to your local community. That means that things you might not be able to support on your own, you can actually begin to introduce to, um, uh, to your own Main Street for the local people to make it a better experience for them. One of the challenges that, and I know that this is really contentious at times, is Many main streets for a wide range of very, very important reasons, largely related to people, um, is that they often close at five or six. And very often, and the work that we did, the survey work and the kind of observation we did looking at a number of main streets, is that we noticed that the, the visitor might have been off um, uh, hiking or swimming or boating or doing something else then we'll want to come downtown to uh, eat and to shop. And often most of the main street is closed. And so one of the things that we introduce is the idea of after six. Now, what happens after six? Now, it's not saying that every store has to be open, but are you offering opportunities for the visitor to do something after six? And obviously the, the challenge then is to then at least at certain times of the year or maybe one day a week of opening up the main street after six to provide a better experience, to attract visitors into your community that may or may not uh, come otherwise. And we suggested, next slide, Tom, um, a number of things that you might do, and I won't go through these, but in many cases, these things are already occurring in one way or another. And how to use music or theater or the celebrations or shows or night markets as a way of extending, if you want, to the, the time that your main street is open. And most importantly, provide a good experience and at the same time, provide added income uh, to your um, um, retail businesses, which we think is incredibly important. So it's this mindset of saying, how can we stay open after six? And again, I want to emphasize, we know there are a number of issues in doing that. Next slide. Our last chapter was done by one of our colleagues from the US. Um, and uh, Jamie is, is 
one of the experts out there. And it's very exciting the way that he begins to think about animating your main street. And um, his chapter is different than others in the sense that he tries to think about what does it mean from the point of view of the retailer and what can that retailer do to improve the experience? And so it's very design oriented. And he likes to say that the experience doesn't start when someone walks into your store, but as they're walking down the sidewalk and looking in the window and, and what kind of opportunities do you provide the visitor to sit and, and talk and then go into your store and then come back out. And so it really is very much attached to the kind of vitality the social life that you have in your main streets that allow you to uh, achieve a higher level of, of performance if you want to. And he's uh, in his writings and he refers to in, in his chapter that he's got some easy steps in the design of your storefront, of the way that you present the, the services and products that you um, are selling. And how do you ensure that there's a complete cohesive view of the um, uh, opportunities that you provide to the visitor. Thanks, Walter. Just a couple of quick acknowledgements, of course, to Walter, uh, who's been the driving force of this, um, especially to, and to Natasha, who we've mentioned a few times too, uh, her work uh, really informed much of what we did. Uh, there was a number of student researchers worked with us over the last uh, 18 months, two years or so. Uh, Annie, Nathaniel, Lucia, and Wahid, thank you. Um, and in terms of just creating the, the handbook itself, uh, Michelle Jameson uh, provided a huge amount of work and effort into this. So thanks to Michelle. And then Dominic and Akshay uh, also helped create the, the design and provided photography for the handbook as well. And so, you know, just to kind of conclude this is uh you know it's a living document um we are uh always looking to improve and add and develop so you know we welcome uh contact and interaction and questions and suggestions uh so please uh keep in touch and that's it uh be very happy to take your questions Wonderful. So if anyone has any questions, please type them in the Q&A. Um, that would be great. Uh, so Jacqueline wants to know how do we get a copy of the research? Tom already is on that and popped it up there. Do you know what, Sonia? I think I can only, for some reason, I can only chat with you and Walter. I can't seem to oh, chat with okay. the whole group. Yeah, so it's best to use the uh, Q&A function, um, but uh, I will double check. It should be um, to everybody. So I think, Tom, you could just type, when you go into your chat, you say everyone as a panelist. It, it does no? not give me that option, but um, this is the web link down here. Um, we will send it out via email as well uh, after this uh, this webinar. But if you go, if you Google Main Street Reimagined Toronto Metropolitan, uh, it will be there. So, and you can't put it into the. No, I wasn't able to, but this is the website, um, and so here you'll be able to. You know, download the full handbook, and then here we have the the, the webinars for each of the uh, the thirteen chapters down here. And so the website is. Uh, oh, sorry, you can chat with everyone on there now, Tom. Great, I'll just paste that there. But Martin did put that in there. Thank you, Martin. And Maureen just asked a question in the chat. Uh, Maureen, did your research find most BIAs are under-resourced and ill-equipped to tell, tackle the multi-pronged approach suggested? Um, you know, I think BIAs are varied. And of course, there are some BIAs uh, that have more resources and some that have less. Uh, and I think it's also clear that some BIAs have different priorities than others. Um, you know, it also became quite uh, apparent to us that 
you know, many BIAs are, especially since COVID, but since before COVID, were just struggling with developing their communities in a, uh, you know, a, a, to be more prosperous and, you know, dealing with some of the issues, the social issues, the economic concerns of their, their businesses. You know, where does uh, the visitor economy fall on their priority list? And, and absolutely, that was uh, apparent um, for a number of people we spoke to. Um, however, and, and Walter, maybe you can jump in as well, but I think our, our, my response would be, you know, uh, whatever you are considering to develop or initiatives you're planning, just to have uh, a little bit of a lens of how might the visitor economy fit into this or be impacted by this. Are, this, are there things that we could do that would just small tweaks on what we're already doing that would enhance the opportunities for um, to make our destination more appealing for visitors. I think that's the kind of the approach that I would advocate at this stage. Walter. Yeah, I, I wanted to amplify what Tom just said is that it's partly a mindset. Just saying, you know what, we can be more attractive to visitors uh, if we do certain small tactical things. Might be when you're doing an event, you think about the fact that how do we reach out to the larger community around you? So that's, I think, one point. To stress that partnerships then become really important, that potentially your, your partner might be the local tourism authority or the economic development authority, who may have resources to help you in um, achieving um, um, this success. And one of the things that we do talk about in certain of the chapters is who else is out there? So if, you're, if you really don't have time to do a marketing study, if you want to, maybe there's a community college um, or a senior high school class or a university group that might do that for you. Um, the mapping exercise could be done by uh, a community group or volunteers. So some of this um, doesn't mean that the Main Street coordinator who already is overloaded has more work to do, but maybe you can reach out and find people who would be happy to work with you. And so in the mapping exercise, you know, I talk about the fact that you can uh, work with your local historical society or a civic society that might be quite happy to work with you and to help you that or developing your story. So very often there are people within the community that could really help to do that. Um, the other part of it, and the last thing I wanted to say here, Tom, is that maybe this is a longer term effort that you begin to recognize you want to do it, start to do the things in a, in, a, in a modest way. And over time, if you're finding that the that you're reaching out to the visitor is having positive results, then you might be able to find resources to help you to do that. Thanks, Walter. There's a there's a question from Melody, and Walter, I, you know, this is a this is a big challenge. Um, Melody says one of the one of our challenges right now is labor shortages. Um, as a result, many businesses on our main street have reduced hours. Do you have ideas as to how businesses and destinations can overcome this challenge? Um, yeah, I mean, as I said, one of the things that consistently we're we're hearing is that there is already the people who own run these uh, run a business are already stretched. They have families and community obligations and a whole series of other things to deal with. So the idea here might be that rather than opening at nine in the morning, one day a week, you might open at noon and stay open till eight or nine. So that's, it's not necessarily adding on extra time. It's saying, is there a way that we can um, uh, put in the same amount of time, but maybe open later on certain days, especially in the summer season in certain destinations where, you know there's going to be more likelihood. Um, it also might mean that uh, the businesses that are already open after six, um, you you do better PR and marketing around them to let people know that we are open after six. The restaurant, the coffee shop, maybe the craft shop is open after six. Um, and what we found in some of the work we've done is that over a period of time, the other retailers start to see the advantages from an economic perspective to maybe hire somebody part-time to help them in the evenings. So it's really not a question of everyone having to be open, 
but that there's a critical mass of things that are there. Um, and to ensure that you get the buy-in from your stakeholders, i.e. the Main Street people. And it might be some communities can't do it. Other communities might find it of advantage to them that they're uh, able to increase their bottom line by being open and taking advantage of the visitor economy. Not easy. Huh? Uh, yeah. Um, there's a there's another question from Gwendal who uh, is asking about visitor accommodation. Um, and that nearby neighborhood high streets outside of downtowns, visitor accommodation is often lacking. Do we have any thoughts on how to think about a shift from exclusive reliance on short-term rental to one that includes commercial visitor accommodation appropriate to commercial high streets? Um, I mean, my uh, understanding of zoning and, and, and such from a planning perspective um, is a little lacking and perhaps Walter, you have a bit more on that. I mean, my, my, my initial reaction is to think about um, friends and relatives. Uh, so this is not commercial accommodation, obviously, but you know, friends and relatives provide accommodation to visitors and, and if bringing overnight visitors to a community is uh, of interest, thinking about engaging residents to, to invite them and, and perhaps providing some kind of incentives to residents, not necessarily money, but, you know, offering residents some kind of experience or value that they can take with their guests to the to the main street, whether it's, you know, perhaps it's an off-menu meal at a restaurant or a meeting with a, you know, somebody important or, you know, like something that, that would be kind of exclusive to the resident with their guest to encourage people to come and visit. Um, that's something I, I've definitely been thinking about a lot, but in terms of actual creation of, of paid accommodations, uh, Walter, do you have any? Yeah, Tom, I mean, I think one of the things that, uh, it's a great question, by the way, and obviously, if you can keep people in your community overnight, all the, the research indicates that the uh, overall financial return to the community is significant as compared to the, the day tripper, the person who comes in. We were thinking much more about somebody um, uh, from the, um, the town down the road um, or in a larger urban area, uh, two neighborhoods away. So it was really more somebody that would come in for the evening or during the day um, as opposed to living there. But obviously any community that can develop an accommodation sector that um, uh, would provide opportunities to stay overnight, there's certainly a much larger economic um, return. But initially, at least, our intention would be for Main Streets to think about who can they invite with an easy driving or walking distance of where they are, as opposed to having um, um, a, an accommodation infrastructure to, to support that visitor. And another part of that is just thinking about who the current visitors are and how can we encourage them to do more, more often. Um, and so thinking about encouraging people to come back more frequently, encouraging people to stay a little longer, encouraging people to visit not just the shop that they came to visit, but also an additional shop or an additional shop. And, and, and the, how, what information and incentives and promotion and communication can we provide people to uh, you know, expand their interaction with our community while they're already there. Tom, can I just say, uh, just to build on that, is that when we talk about the storytelling and mapping exercises, one of the ways that you might get people into your main street is not necessarily that the main street is their sole reason for visiting the community. They might want to go on a nature walk, or they might want to go on an historical walk, or they might want to use a, um, a, a recreation area and then come to your main street or the other way around. So it's really trying to think in a more holistic sense of what is that visitor looking for? And it might be shopping, it might be eating, um, but they also might want to have a unique um, nature walk with the family so that they're going to come to your community and eat um, on the main street and shop on the main street. Great. Thank you, Tom. I really liked that idea because um, I think that that is something that's 
um, would really encourage residents uh, and other visitors, right? I mean, um, Explorer's Edge does that up in Muskoka where they give the $100 credit to um, various participating restaurants and attractions. And I think that really is a driver um, to get people up there in their uh, off seasons, right? But um, I quite like that idea, you know, as someone who, who lives close to a main street. Um, that uh, that's something then that I would encourage you know people to come up and and take them out to because I love my little main street and and you know I always bring guests there myself but um, you're right also too what you're saying Walter because you know we're close to a provincial park um, perhaps people are coming up to the provincial park for hiking or some other um, you know tobogganing or whatever it is that's going on there and then you know the main street's only five minutes away um, and there might not be a connection between the two. Um, so thank you. I, I really appreciate a lot of those uh, responses. Um, so we're almost up to our time. Um, we can squeeze in one other question. Um, otherwise, um, I think we will invite everybody to check out the wonderful website um, that uh, Tom and Walter have developed. And as always, they are open for any questions or follow up. Um, if you wish to reach out, uh, please do so. Um, and thank you all for attending. Tom or Walter, did you want to have any last words? I just want to say that we really do welcome feedback. And if you have a case study, an example that you want to share, we'd love to get it. And uh, we're looking at introducing in um, uh, some case studies when we receive them. So if you really want to tell your story, we'd love to hear from you and we can help you put that together. Great, thank you. Um, that's, that's wonderful. So thank you so much. Um, and we appreciate you all coming. Happy holidays to everyone on here um, and a wonderful end to all of your years. Uh, and hopefully we will see you in the new year um, and we can talk more about Main Street. Maybe we'll do another one where it's focused on best practices and examples um, of best practices that uh, we can follow up on in the new year. Wonderful. Thanks, Thank everyone. So Thanks, everyone. Take care.